and we're live and welcome to another episode of Machine Medicine's interview series. And this week we are honored to have uh, Professor Christos Konstantininus uh, with us uh, from Vanderbilt University. And, and Christos, thank you for being here. It would be great uh, to uh, hear a little about, you know, what you do in your lab, but even more, uh, even sort of prior to that, sort of how you got into this area. And I understand you're a biomedical engineer by by background, but that is a very broad church. So, so what do you guys do and, and how did you get there as, as an individual? Certainly, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here to be joining you. Thank you for the kind invitation. Um, so let me start with a brief bio. I, uh, I am now a uh, professor of biomedical engineering, neuroscience and ophthalmology and visual sciences at Vanderbilt University. I received my PhD originally in neuroscience, actually, at Johns Hopkins University uh, and did postdoctoral fellowship at Yale University. And ever since then, uh, the focus of my work was understanding the neural signals from the brain, trying to understand initially how the electrical activity of neurons in the brain gives rise to mental phenomena, such as working memory or attention or the ability to make thoughts and make decisions. Um, so we, I've entered the field of neuromodulation relatively recently. You know, once we had accumulated this basic understanding with the neural mechanisms of cognitive functions, you know, we thought, can we do anything about it? All right, so we have some understanding now of the signals, the structures that mediate these, these functions, but can we do something to actually improve cognitive function uh, in, in, in ultimately in patients, in people who really mm -hmm. stand to benefit from that. So the program we've built the last uh, five or six years has focused on using deep brain stimulation as a form of neuromodulation that can improve working memory and cognitive functions. Fascinating. And so um, why is it uh, that you decided to use deep brain stimulation? Because I think some people would argue that well, there's quite a lot of evidence that non-invasive neuromod neuromodulation can uh, enhance cognitive performance. And when we think about, you know, dealing with the, the pandemic of dementia, then arguably non-invasive approaches are, 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 are much easier from a regulatory perspective and to get to market, yada, yada, yada. So what was, what was it about DBS that made you think, look, this is the paradigm that we should be using to explore this? I mean, certainly uh, when we started out, I mean, we had exactly the same thought that a non-invasive neuromodulator, uh, neuromodulatory procedure would likely to be, uh, to, be, to be a better means of doing that easier and less invasive, involving less risk. Uh, you know, but we discovered that what we have available right now really does not have the spatial resolution and it doesn't have the specificity that we can gain with deep brain stimulation. And that doesn't preclude that in the future, technologies will progress and will become much more powerful and will allow us to achieve the same goals. So in a way, what we're doing now with deep brain stimulation sort of paves the, the, the way for you know, identifying the targets and identifying the parameters of stimulation that may be achieved with other modalities as well in the future, but to, to, to really get uh, some conclusive and decisive results that show the viability basically of this approach, we felt that we had to go to this, you know, to start with this more precise, more, more, more invasive, but at the same time, more precise means of stimulation. Okay, interesting. Um, and, and one of the other things that struck me uh, uh, when I was reading um, uh, uh, one of your review articles recently um, was that, um, and I think you mentioned a moment ago about we, how we've, we've made real progress in terms of the mechanistic understanding of the processes underlying cognition. Um, so, uh, um, what, what are your what are your thoughts on on how how good our mechanistic uh, understanding of uh, cognition is? Because I guess you know the the, the lesson that we would uh, draw from the pharmaceutical industry is that really kind of things like the amyloid hypothesis about uh, dementia and so forth. It's, it's, I guess the jury's still out, but certainly in terms of the clinical trials that have been performed on um, anti-amyloid uh, therapeutics, it looks pretty much like a, a desert in terms of results. Maybe Biogen have something, however, it looks pretty ropey. Uh, so uh, do you feel like we, we're in a position now where we essentially understand, you know, not everything, but a lot of what's going on in, in dementia? 
your 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 question had raises a lot of interesting points. So let me yeah, let me answer by unpacking it a little bit. Yeah, so, sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think it was, you raise all the important uh, all the important issues in the field. So uh, the first model when we entered my lab when we entered the field of neuromodulation, you know, and deep brain stimulation, you know, we thought the most urgent and the most important model uh, that, that we need to address is that of Alzheimer's disease, a, a degenerative condition for which there is no treatment, there is no way to halt the disease, the etiology of the disease is also not very well understood, and uh, a, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's today means that this patient will inexorably decline and, and we have no means basically of halting that. So that was really the, the, the area that we first uh, thought that we're, we, you know, we needed to, to enter and we needed to address. Uh, and, and as you said, uh, a lot of research effort has been devoted to Alzheimer's disease and a lot of bright, bright scientists, a very capable scientists have worked in this area for a long period of time and the results have frankly been disappointed. Uh, I, you know, I don't want to offend my colleagues that work in this field, but we really, we truly do not have a treatment uh, the, the pathologies that are well identified and well understood in Alzheimer's disease, the uh, the, the accumulation of uh, amyloid plaques and, and tangles looked like very logical targets for the development of drugs that will clear them or will stop their production. And yet, uh, exactly as you mentioned, uh, there has been a lot of disappointments and a lot of dead ends. We really don't have any drugs basically that can uh, that can stop the, you know, cure the disease or even stop the progression of cognitive mm. decline. Uh, so how well we understand the circuits that mediate that, uh, we understand at some level, we understand them well, but obviously there's a lot of depth that we don't understand yet. Mm. Uh, but for the type of neuromodulation that we're looking at, uh, you know, we feel that we have a good enough understanding of the basic system and we can, we can address it. So the area that we have focused, that our DPS paradigm has focused, is the cholinergic forebrain, and specifically the nucleus basalis of Maynard, which is the source of acetylcholine mm -hmm. in the brain, in, 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 the, uh, in, in the human brain, in the primate brain, uh, in the neocortex, in the, cerebral, in the cerebral cortex. So by targeting this area, we have, in essence, the ability to turn the switch on and off of acetylcholine release in the brain. Mm -hmm. And there's and there's strong evidence that uh, in Alzheimer's disease, one of the first areas of degeneration is in fact the basal, uh, basal forebrain. So mm -hmm. if we're able to artificially stimulate this area, I think we have two mechanistic benefits at the same time. Number one, we release acetylcholine which is essential for cognitive functions. It's mm -hmm. essentially the volume control of the brain, you know, that Alzheimer's patients lose and, uh, and frontline medication in Alzheimer's patients like donepezil, Iricept, it precisely do that, precisely enhance the action of acetylcholine. But we can do that endogenously, uh, which has many benefits to do that. So number one, we can release more acetylcholine. We have more active activity of the of this cholinergic system. Mm -hmm. And number two, uh, that there is at least some indirect evidence that the basal forebrain is part of the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's. When this area degenerates, then all the downstream targets, all the areas that normally receive innervation from basal forebrain, begin to atrophy and begin to degenerate themselves. So I, I'm oversimplifying basically the system, which is much more complex. But I think at the basic level, you know, we have some idea of the circuit that we're targeting and, you know, we have reasons to believe that uh, by focusing neuromodulation there, we can, uh, we can stop or we can, we can uh, stop the progression of the disease and at the same time, uh, offer cognitive improvement basically in these patients that will either uh, otherwise have, have no act, uh, effective treatment. Fascinating. So so yeah, uh, so on the, on the one hand, the, the idea is just to, so, to make sure I understand, to summarize uh, some of what you said. On the one hand, um, we, we do have the very good evidence that denapazil and other similar drugs at least uh, delay and perhaps cause it, well, cause a transitory improvement in cognition, but then afterwards there's this kind of decline so that I think the thought is generally that it's probably not uh, retarding the disease in any respect, but it 
it does uh, give one a sort of plateau in symptoms, uh, maybe even a small rise. But then on the uh, then the second thing is that uh, you, you mentioned that there's quite a lot of pathological evidence that actually these systems are, are the first to go and, and may well um, underlie the sort of the fundamental path pathology of, of conditions like Alzheimer's. And then one of the things that's sort of interesting is to consider, um, you know, what are you what are you trying to do in these circuits? Are, are you trying to stimulate in order to uh, in order to interfere with the kind of dynamical systems properties of the brain? Or are you trying to stimulate in order to, uh, say, uh, prompt uh, neuro uh, neuro generation or new new uh, uh, new cell uh, proliferation of, of, of the appropriate types, astrocytes and, and neurons, I guess? Um, uh, or are you trying to do both? All right, very good. So that was another very dense question that Sorry. raises. Oh no, it was excellent. It was excellent. That raises again all the important issues and all the important poisons that we're trying to achieve. So let me start from the first part of your question then. So our frontline treatment of Alzheimer's disease. If a patient is diagnosed today with Alzheimer's, you know, the frontline medication is going to be acetylcholine acetylcholinesterase inhibitors like Aricept, for example, which do not provide a treatment for the condition. Mm -hmm. but they uh, delay the progression of cognitive symptoms. So they, they offer some relief then from cognitive symptoms. But exactly as you described, this is temporary, uh, you know, the period of a few months at best, and then the effectiveness of this medication starts to decline. So, uh, and there are several reasons for that. So by doing this systemic, essentially giving these drugs systemically, number one, uh, the acetylcholine, receptors exist everywhere in the body. So the dose that one can effectively uh, administer or safely mm -hmm. administer cannot be very high because they're going to be peripheral side effects. So we're limited in the dosage. Secondly, when you uh, give a drug systemically, then essentially you have action of this drug 24 hours a day, basically, whether you, whether you need it, whether the brain needs it or not, basically. So that's also a uh, that's that's also a, a downside. Um, uh, and, and third, again, you know, this by flooding the system essentially with this uh, indiscriminately by with this drug, you build some some tolerance and it becomes less and less effective. So uh, neuromodulation or deep brain stimulation circumvents all of this all of these problems. So number one, we can time the stimulation. So we can only apply stimulation for a few hours a day during waking hours, during the times of uh, activity and alertness, when, 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 uh, you know, when we want to have a higher alertness, basically. Uh, number two, the, the acetylcholine is only one part of this endogenous system that projects from the basal forebrain. There is evidence that uh, a different type of neuron, GABAergic neurons, also project, and this cannot be captured by the by this drug. So, by again, by stimulating the source of uh, acetylcholine, we have the natural release with all the all the types of neurotransmitters that normally are released simultaneously with with acetylcholine. So that's a more natural uh, way of simulating the the effects of acetylcholine in the brain. Uh, so we were very. Uh, encouraged and we're very excited when we saw in our initial experiments in animal models that by doing this stimulation, the effects of neuromodulation do not plateau and decline, but in fact, they remain steady. And over the period that we, we track, in fact, they accrue and, and they continue to be, the stimulation continues to be activity for active, effective for as long as we've tracked out in time. So that was the, the one big issue basically that uh, that, that that sort of encouraged us, and we thought that we're in the right track uh, in doing that. Uh, and precisely, and exactly, again, as you alluded, so the effect of stimulation is number one to provide this stimulation of the the rest of pretty much the entire mantle of the cerebral cortex that normally gets activated by the release of acetylcholine and prevent. Uh, the degeneration of circuits that may either happen when you have this loss of, of this core of cholinergic stimulation. But uh, again, as you alluded, we have reasons to believe that this causes some long-term plasticity. Uh, it, it causes circuits basically to become more active and that the action of acetylcholine become more effective with, with time. And it's this late results or late effects, basically, that I think is the most promising aspect of neuromodulation 
targeting the cholinergic forebrain. So that's that's really where we stand now, and that's where uh, our understanding is. Very interesting. You mentioned you mentioned something else when, in your in your discussion there about about how the um, paradigm that you seem to be adopting, and I think most other people in this area have adopted, is is in contrast to uh, the stimulation protocols in movement disorders, which tend to be high frequency and continuous stimulation. You opt for a sort of periodic uh, or uh, you know a, um, a, a stimulation paradigm. So can can you talk a bit a little bit about the rationale? Because I guess one would naively think, look, we know that DBS works for Parkinson's disease, so we should just take it and the first thing to do is just apply it in the same way. So, so that's another excellent question. So, question. So, first of all, you know, let me start by saying that you know we have benefited greatly by all the knowledge that has been accumulated by deep brain stimulation for uh, uh, for movement disorders and particularly for Parkinson's disease. So, uh, deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease is almost a routine therapy now. There, there be thousands or uh, tens of thousands of patients that have been stimulated. So, we have accumulated a body or the field has accumulated a body of knowledge we understand uh what is tolerated what is not what's the safety of the procedure how to go about the implantation how to optimize the targeting in in the area that that you're targeting so all this body of work has been done and you know we have been extremely fortunate basically to to start that from this from this knowledge base that the pioneers of movement disorders have accumulated um, so, uh, again, you know, uh, the naive idea is that if, you know, we do deep brain stimulation that works for Parkinson's disease, let's replicate precisely the stimulation parameters uh, in basal forebrain and, and achieve the same goal. But there are, you know, fundamental differences. So th- there is some debate in the field, but uh, our best understanding is that in movement disorders, the loss of a population of neurons in the basal ganglia causes this uncontrollable excitation that Mm. the deep brain stimulation effectively suppresses or effectively Mm. shuts down. So the net effect of deep brain stimulation in movement disorders is to suppress this uncontrollable activity that causes tremor and causes all the side effects of uh, dyskinesias or movement disorders. Now, in the basal forebrain, we have a very different system with very different um, a different function and very different pathology. So here we're looking about, we're looking into a loss of function that is caused by progressive degeneration of neurons. So we have reasons to expect that the activity of the source of acetylcholine decreases. So what we need to do then is increase or boost their activity and uh, bring them to, 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 to a level that mimics the normal uh, firing rate, discharge rate of the neurons in the basal forebrain. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, initially, I mean, our thought was to apply this continuous stimulation and sort of turn these neurons on. But very quickly, we figured out that there's a limit of how much we can do that. And it seems that the system saturates and the effectiveness of stimulation declines if we just do this continuous high frequency stimulation. Mm. So it was really... Um, through trial and error and, and through basically our understanding of the system that we gravitated in this protocol of intermittent stimulation. I think that's what you were trying to describe. So where Sorry. we stimulate for 15 seconds every minute uh, at a rate of uh, 80 hertz. And so we produce about 1,200 pulses per minute or on average about 20 pulses per second, which sort of mimics the uh, the the firing rate, the the real the physiological rate of impulse generation uh, of neurons in in the basal forebrain, but we don't even do it continuously, 20 hertz continuously. But we allow we do this stimulation for a few seconds and allow the system to recover, and then we do it again, uh, and we do that over a period again, a limited period of time during the day. So we have done that typically two hours and that seems to be effective. That seems to be the switch spot that we see the most uh, the most benefits and most effects. And, so, and when you say that seems to be the sweet spot, the, the feedback signal that you're, you're using in order to estimate that sweet spot is, is in animal experiments where you have these behavioral paradigms with uh, a pri- non-human primates performing, uh, performing these cognitive tasks and you're able to measure quite fine 
changes in performance. Is that right? Precisely. So our primary outcome, primary uh, uh, result basically has been how much can we improve working memory and, and attention function mm -hmm. in, in these animal models. And in fact, we, if we found uh, through trial and error that this is, this is the most effective, but it sort of agrees with our understanding of the system you know it makes you know makes a lot of sense mechanistically again you know, that this is the the stimulation regime that is going to be effective rather than try to flood the system continuously with a high frequency stimulation hmm. very interesting um i said and and so the, the the animal models that you're using how confident are you that they're sort of uh, no pun intended aping the real uh, <laughs> the real pathology uh well it is it's the best model that we have available so we use these non-human primate models out of necessity you know that this is the model basically that uh, that has the the anatomy of the brain that most closely resembles the anatomy of, of the human brain and it has a lot of the the, the the behavioral characteristics that you know human cognitive function has so in most recent experiments that we just have just started at Vanderbilt University, we used an aged, aged uh, monkey model, non-human primate model, where we try, where these animals truly uh, through normal aging, basically, they are impaired in the cognitive function just as humans are in old right. age. And there's quite a bit of variability between individuals as well. So some uh, non-human primates age gracefully just as humans do, and some are quite a bit impaired. So we're very interested where, you know, we've just started that in collaboration with human neurosurgeons, and we're trying to uh, have a model that most closely mimics of what we expect, uh, you know, to see in Alzheimer's patients. Gotcha, gotcha, yeah. Um, and, and you mentioned that you're working with, with clinicians on this, because I guess the, the, the clinical literature on stimulation of the, uh, 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 the nucleus of minor is, I mean, it's small numbers, but largely looks quite negative. I mean, some case reports of, of sort of Lazarus-like uh, recoveries, but, but no real sort of statistical evidence. Is that a fair characterization? Or? I, I think that's fair. There have been a few cases which... You know, the, the positive side of it is that, you know, people have tried it and it's fairly safe and it's fairly well tolerated. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these uh, studies, though, have been done with this sort of continuous pattern of stimulation. I think it's right. critical what we're doing different here, this intermittent pa pattern. We, we, we strongly believe that this is going to make the difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were very pleasantly surprised, very encouraged by how positive the clinicians have been and the 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 that, uh, you know, the, the neurosurgeon basically who worked in this field. And the reason for that is really precisely goes back to how disappointing the treatments for Alzheimer's yeah. disease have been. You really have nothing in our arsenal and people are willing to, to, to at least look at other options and try uh, some other approaches because, uh, you know, at present, you know, we have a desert of failed clinical trials. You can otherwise basically have not, have not shown uh, effective yeah. treatment of the condition. Yeah. I mean, I know some people have expressed sort of ethical concerns that we, since we don't really, we're kind of shooting in the dark a little bit uh, with DBS, we shouldn't really um, be doing these um, procedures on people at least. But my own feeling is that anyone that's seen dementia, as I'm sure most of us have, um, appreciate that it's such a devastating condition of almost anybody. I think certainly I would, would, would grab at any opportunity to sort of even uh, try an experimental therapy. Precisely. Uh, so, so, so there are two components. So first of all, you know, we, we are very mindful of the ethical implications of that, you know, of trying an untested procedure and, and essentially uh, an untested system, basically, in human patients. And that's why we feel very strongly that the animal work is very important. We really have to work out some basic parameters of stimulation We find out you know, what works and what doesn't before we, you know, before we translate that in humans. But at the same time, you know, that the devastation basically of an Alzheimer's diagnosis, for example, is such that, you know, people are willing, people are, you know, want to volunteer and families are willing basically to do venture into this unknown, venture in this void and, and try something that, you know, has realistic probability of working or of being affected. So I think that's, that's how, you know, we view basically the, the ethical dilemmas of, of doing yeah. an invasive stimulation. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, another thing that I thought was really interesting uh, about your your work was that you're 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 leveraging the the animal paradigm that you use in order to obtain a feedback signal that, as you mentioned a moment ago, was allowed had allowed you to identify the sweet spot in the um, I, I guess the interval in your intermittent uh, stimulation uh, paradigm. And um, I wonder what your thoughts are on, on the kind of the, the feedback kind of uh, this ultimately achieving you know some kind of closed loop. Um, uh, do you, do you, I mean, so we, we now have uh, devices, even commercially available devices now that are, are capable of recording local field potential. There's a lot of excitement in movement disorders about it. Not much evidence yet, but but some sort of early promising signs. What are your thoughts on on the, on the appropriate feedback loop? Should we use, be using something behavioral or should we be using local field potentials or some hybrid of the two or, or and some other group of, of, of biosignal perhaps? So, so that's an excellent, another excellent question. Uh, so in the animal model, we in fact have done that. So we have closed the loop by doing stimulation in the basal front brain mm -hmm. and recording neural activity. So uh, isolated spiking activity from the prefrontal cortex and mm -hmm. local field potentials. So that's another benefit basically the animal models that we were able then to see precisely what this brain stimulation in the, in the center of the brain does in these areas that are in fact mediating uh, working memory function and cognitive function. And in fact, these are the results we just, we just published uh, this month basically. And we have now an understanding of what uh, the activity is doing. And then we can work backwards and see then what parameters of stimulation can optimize this, this activity basically that will translate into cognitive benefit. Uh, once we have these knowledge, then yes, we can uh, we can do the same in in human patients, or we can at least record some signals, uh, such as some population signals, or volume signals like uh, local field potentials, or mm. potentially EG signals as well. Which again, we can use as a way of optimizing uh, stimulation. We we're not quite there yet. I mean, we we needed to work out. We have not attempted it because we needed to work out all the do all the groundwork first. But eventually, this is definitely. Uh, this is definitely the future and uh, as you said again we're benefiting from developments in this area and that more and more sophisticated closed loop stimulation devices have been yeah, becoming available uh with a, with a movement disorders being a big a, you know, primary driver of yeah. technological innovation that in that respect as well that, that we're very delighted basically to ride on their coattails and adopt yeah. you know what we've seen work one of the things that occurred to me the other day when I was uh, thinking about this and, and listening to somebody talk about some of the work in uh, in, in this area was that uh, they were talking about how much work has been done in movement disorders, as, as you mentioned. And uh, I was thinking, isn't it isn't it a shame that, you know, obviously, in, typically in, in movement disorders, people are, are being stimulated in different um, at different sort of regions. But but one feels with something like 100,000 people with uh, movement disorders implanted with DBS systems and many different parameter settings and so forth. There's this one, it must, and it often does have an impact upon cognition. It seems like there's this sort of, uh, there's this data, which is just sort of, as it were, washing down the drain. And presumably there might be deep insights that could be garnered from this, you know, this, there's this, if we look, we're able to look at these, these patients at the kind of big data level that, that would be possible if we had this data, and we might be able to identify, oh, you know, there's a correlation with the frequency or something in these patients, even though we're stimulating this subthalamic nucleus or the globus pallidus, something like in this, this seems sort of uh, somewhat of a shame. All right, very good. So you raise again, two or three, you know, excellent points. So let's try to unpack those. So, you know, first of all, uh, there are out of the thousands of patients that have been implanted with electrodes, there are some electrodes that have missed their target that, that, that right. in fact have, uh, you know, we have implanted patients today as we speak basically that have electrodes near or at the nucleus basalis or minor. Right. In fact, some of the initial clinical studies were done precisely in patients that, you know, by, by accident, you know, yeah. had this, this electrodes basically implanted at. Uh, you know, on those patients that did have uh, you know, true subthalamic stimulation and basal ganglia stimulation. Uh, I think there have been some, you know, secondary studies that have looked at cognitive 
you know, cognitive facts. Yeah. And my understanding of this literature, I, I don't want to venture, you know, in, in, in this field that, uh, you know, I, it's not the core of my expertise, but, but my understanding is that generally these have not been positive. So, you know, just the simulation, at least at those parameters, at these high frequency parameters of the yeah. basal ganglia, uh, generally do not translate in cognitive improvement. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is something we're very interested in. So, in fact, uh, we, in collaboration with, with two groups of clinicians at Vanderbilt and at the Medical College mm -hmm. of Georgia, we are, we want to do exactly what you described, to, to find patients that have already in, been implanted with electrodes near our, our intended targets, see if we can mm -hmm. uh, approach them and see if we can apply experimentally this, this protocol of intermittent stimulation and see if you know at least some secondary measures of improvement yeah. of cognitive metabolism. You know, perhaps PET imaging. You know, we can see that we can. You know, that this is really a viable approach in human patients without having to do anything invasive in new patients. So I think that's a that's a very yeah. promising approach that we, we, we and, we're and very intent on exploring. And of course, it might be it might be informative even even if you don't find. Uh, say parameter settings that improve cognition. It might be informative to find what parameter set settings most, uh, as it were, optimal, optimally impair cognition. Right? Like I, want to I mean, uh, absolutely. We want to know either way. You know, we don't. Yeah. You know, we certainly don't want to go. You know, down the dead end. Yes. Yes. Well, that would be. I uh, look forward to seeing the results of your uh, of, of that work. So yeah, fascinating. Um, Christos, I'm conscious that we've come to the end of our allotted time, and I know you're a busy man. However, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you about this fascinating area, and I think one that one that really sort of illustrates the the, the vast potential of neuromodulation uh, to deal with some of the you know the serious sort of economic uh, and and medical uh, problems that face the world today, what with aging populations and so forth. So um, thank you very much. Um, as I say, we'll keep a close eye on your on your progress in the future. And I look forward to chatting again sometime not in the not too distant future, I hope. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure being here. And I have greatly enjoyed your uh, interview series. And I'm looking forward to learning more as well uh, about, this, the, uh, about this field. Thank you. Brilliant.